of potential alternatives to petrol for cars as a way of reducing the threat of global warming. That threat exists in large measure due to the release of carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. At the moment, we're chucking 3,000 million tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year, and that's growing at an annual rate of about 0.4%. Now, vehicles represent a prime target for controlling carbon dioxide because they contribute at the moment about 20%, about a fifth of the total. The whole industry is aware of American attempts to reduce carbon dioxide pollution by increasing engine efficiency. The proposed American corporate average fuel economy standards, for example, will mean by 1995 a 20% reduction in fuel consumption, by the year 2000 a 40% reduction. So very tough standards to meet. Now, we saw last week that trying to eliminate fossil fuels by going, for example, to solar-powered batteries does not represent a viable option, not for the foreseeable future anyway. But there is another portable energy source that might just work, namely hydrogen. She drops her line. This voyage is over. And tonight, she is going back to Germany. And then... Hindenburg crash was a public relations disaster for the use of hydrogen. And for many people, the idea of using it instead of petrol would probably be regarded as insane. Certainly, it can form an explosive mixture in concentrations as low as 4%. But strange as it may seem, it's less likely than petrol to catch fire, an accident, for example, if it touches something hot. And in its favour, you can run a conventional engine on it. And in fact, the first work on that was to see if some of the lift hydrogen in airships could be used to power the propellers. Precisely that kind of work was being carried out here at Shoreham in Sussex in the mid-twenties by Ricardo Engineering. Sir Harry Ricardo himself was one of the great pioneers of the internal combustion engine. And the company that now bears his name employs some 400 people and does all kinds of research for most of the big names in the car industry. Now those airships engines run into serious trouble from backfiring an engine knock and so on. But in recent years, the idea of hydrogen as a vehicle fuel has been revived for two very good reasons. It's clean and it's abundant. Indeed, hydrogen is the ultimate clean fuel. Burn hydrogen, you get water. No carbon monoxide, no unburnt hydrocarbons, certainly no carbon dioxide. The big problems are storing it safely and carrying enough of the stuff around. Indeed, all the alternatives show just how convenient petrol is as a mobile fuel because it's so energy efficient. You get so much for so little. This volume of hydrogen, for example, contains only the same amount of energy as this tiny amount of petrol. Now, as a gas, of course, you can compress it, but it's still heavy and bulky. If you want the hydrogen equivalent, for example, of a 16-gallon petrol tank, it would weigh a tonne and occupy two cubic metres, four times bigger than the biggest BMW boot. That's why BMW have opted for liquefying the hydrogen at a very low temperature but it still weighs three times the petrol equivalent and takes up four times the room. To compensate for the low range, this BMW retains its petrol tank, so the engine can run on both fuels. Now, if you don't like the idea of a high-pressure cryogenic or very cold vessel in the boot of your car, not many people would, another method is to fix the hydrogen onto metal pellets, like these of iron, manganese and titanium, in the hydride form. Very safe. You simply have to heat the pellets to release the hydrogen, but again, it's as bulky and heavy as the liquid option. It would take 15 minutes or so to get a tank full. In practice, it would limit vehicle ranges. Mercedes tried out this method in Berlin in the 80s for buses and taxis, but eventually shelved the scheme, mainly because of the petrol glut. But despite the problems, hydrogen remains a very attractive potential fuel, so where do we get it from? Well, we can't use fossil fuel as a source because that would still cause pollution. But remember that combustion equation. Hydrogen plus oxygen equals water. There's lots of hydrogen in water, there's plenty of water around, all we have to do is to split it. The process is called electrolysis and that needs electricity. So as with batteries and electric vehicles, the cleanness of a hydrogen system, that is the extent to which it reduces pollution, depends upon the method you choose to generate the electricity. If you do that by burning fossil fuels, then of course we're no better off. In Sweden in the early 80s, the well gas project turned to wind as the source of energy. The wind produced electricity, which was used to split water by electrolysis, to give hydrogen for cooking and heating and powering the specially converted car. Unfortunately, in a moderately windy location, with the generator running continuously on maximum output, it would only produce enough hydrogen for about 80 miles driving a day. And that's with no cooking or heating. So once again, the power source is not big enough. 
The BMW, by contrast, have opted for solar power to produce the electricity, as in the Swiss solar car, but instead of charging batteries, they're using it to produce hydrogen as the mobile energy store. But will the numbers ever add up? So to sum up where we've got to in our quest to reduce carbon dioxide pollution, you could have a huge impact by dispensing with fossil fuels for vehicles and moving over to hydrogen systems or to batteries, provided, of course, you used a cleaner electrical generation system, such as wind or solar power, some people would say nuclear power. But, and it's a big but, although it's technically feasible, neither hydrogen nor batteries really represents a practical proposition for the next five or ten years or so, because neither gives us the range nor the flexibility of motoring we've come to expect or that we need to keep the economy moving. So let's move on to more practical propositions, such as using petrol and diesel more efficiently or less polluting fossil fuels, the kind of research they've been carrying out here at Ricardo for many, many years. Take methane, for example, natural gas, the stuff that comes out of the North Sea. This bus engine here has been converted to run on compressed natural gas instead of diesel. It does so very happily and in doing so, churns out 20% less carbon dioxide for the same work. Now, why only a bus engine, you might ask? We're back to the same old problem. The compressed methane contains only about a third of the energy of the same volume of diesel. So this option is really only suitable for vehicles with a limited range requirement, such as buses and delivery vans. But the engine does run very cleanly. It runs also very quietly, so there are local benefits. Less noise, less smoke, less nitrogen oxides that cause acid rain. But it doesn't solve the problem of the domestic car or the long-range vehicle. So what about methanol? Very close chemically to methane, or natural gas, but it's liquid and therefore easier to handle. Methanol is the clean fuel that the Americans have gone for in a big way, and the work here at Ricardo supports that approach. A lot of combustion research is carried out on single cylinder engines like this one. This is the piston out of it, and by using the latest laser techniques, they can actually observe the air flows through this transparent top and get a much more efficient result. The overall conclusions are that uh, methanol would certainly reduce smog and acid rain. You've only got about half as much energy as the same tank full of petrol. You've got over 10% less carbon dioxide emissions, and obviously a big improvement. And both Mercedes and Volvo had methanol engine cars on show at Geneva, mainly perhaps for the American market, but no doubt available in Europe if required. Well, methanol and hydrogen may seem a trifle alien to the many fans of the superb petrol engines that Jaguar, for example, have developed. But times they are a-changing. The whole industry is taken very seriously indeed, those American corporate average fuel economy standards. The standards proposed for 1995, for example, can only currently be met by cars as small as the Fiesta and the Escort. Those proposed for the year 2000 take us into the realms of the Fiat Panda and the large motorcycle. So it could well be a case of enjoy your luxury cars while you may.